Pro Wrestling Almanac Podcast. Celebrating professional wrestling from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. For wrestling fans, by wrestling fans. Hey, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to episode 13 of the Pro Wrestling Almanac podcast. This week's episode, we're going to discuss the future endeavors releases from the WWE, Braun Strowman's reaction to being thrown into a trash truck, WWE's announces the 25th anniversary taping of Raw. We'll also be reviewing JR's book, Slobberknocker, My Life in Wrestling. For our Ghosts in Wrestling Past segment, we will cover WCW Fall Brawl 1997 and our Indie Spotlight segment featuring Defy Wrestling from Seattle, Washington. But first, it's time for the Wrestling Results Roundup. Wrestling Results Roundup. Here are the results from this week's televised shows. On NXT, Tino Sabatelli and Riddick Moss beat Danny Burch and Oni Lorcan. Nikki Cross won a battle royal and qualified for the NXT Women's Championship match at TakeOver. And Andrade Cien Almas beat Roderick Strong. On Impact Wrestling, James Storm and Impact Grand Champion Ethan Carter III beat El Hio del Fantasma and Tejano. Petey Williams beat Kiyomiya, Idris Abraham and Tarek. Johnny Impact and Garza Jr. beat Global Champion Eli Drake and Chris Adonis. X Division Champion Trevor Lee beat Ultimo Ninja and Moose beat Lashley. On WWE Main Event, Matt Hardy beat Kurt Hawkins, and Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows beat Titus O'Neil and Apollo Crews. On Ring of Honor TV, Jonathan Gresham beat TK O'Ryan, World Champion Cody beat Scorpio Sky, and Jay Lethal and Kushida beat The Addiction, Christopher Daniels, and Frankie Kazarian. On WWE Raw, Nia Jax beat Bailey, Samoa Joe beat Apollo Crews, Intercontinental Champion The Miz beat Matt Hardy, Asuka beat Stacey Cullen, Finn Balor beat Cesaro, Kane beat Seth Rollins, Heath Slater and Rhino beat Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows in a trick or street fight, Kalisto beat Drew Gulak, and Raw Women's Champion Alexa Bliss beat Mickey James. On WWE SmackDown Live, Bobby Roode beat Dolph Ziggler in a two out of three falls match to qualify for the SmackDown Men's Survivor Series team. United States Champion Baron Corbin fought Sin Cara to a double countout. AJ Styles beat Samir Singh. Rusev beat Big E. And Shinsuke Nakamura beat Kevin Owens to qualify for the SmackDown Men's Survivor Series team. On WWE 205 Live, Akira Tozawa beat Drew Gulak, Rich Swan beat The Brian Kendrick, and Mustafa Ali beat Grand Metalik, Arya Davari, and Tony Nese. And that's all for this week's Wrestling Results Roundup. Hey everyone, I'm Mike alongside with the founder of ProWrestlingAlmanac.com, Tristan. What's going on, buddy? Not a whole lot. Tired, tired, but uh, plus side is that operations are necessitating that I do not have to be at work until 10 o'clock tomorrow. It's going to be oh. a ten, it's going to be a 10 hour day. Yeah, but, but you know what? That's that's still not that bad. Yeah, and so I'll get to recover from podcast day. Oh, not bad. Usually well, podcast day kills me. Yeah, I know the feeling. Uh, looks like I'm going to have to take out a mortgage, <laughs> a second mortgage. Why is that? Taylor decided that she wants to be a goalie. Oh, boy. 
Yeah, her uh, her hockey team didn't have a dedicated goalie this season, so they've been letting the kids volunteer. And she played goalie last Saturday, and she did really well. Um, first time ever in the net, first time ever with the pads on. Uh, her team. This is a team they played uh, four weeks ago and lost nine to four against. She comes into the net, and they they still lost, but they lost four to two. Yeah. So, well, it doesn't it doesn't hurt that she's a big girl. So well, she's 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 built. To be, I mean, she could be a uh, power forward too, but she's well, built she to has, be a, a a goal a goalkeeper. She, she plays goalie in soccer. She yeah. has the goalie mentality. The difference is soccer costs me forty bucks for a set of goalie gloves. Hockey sets you back anywhere from four hundred to thirteen hundred dollars for goalie equipment. Yeah, especially so. considering that she's you know nine and going to continue to get bigger and bigger yeah anywhere between 511 and 61 oh joy so yeah. but uh other than that and then uh bad news dodgers lost so yeah well you know good for the astros and good on them know, the city yeah. the city needed it so i'm not looking forward to hearing booker t on Monday, but then again, that that's pretty much the case every Monday now because Booker that is, T is just awful lately. He he has been. Um, I really think there's something going on between him and Titus O'Neil because he just does everything he can to take a dig at Titus, and Corey Graves loves digging at Booker because oh, of Titus. Oh yes, and well, I mean, and so, a lot of things. <laughs> Well, but, supposedly, yeah. you know, the rumors have been going around that I've I've been hearing, you know, Booker, being from the Houston area, has been thinking about running for mayor of Houston. Oh, he's running uh, for mayor of Houston, like he's but already I've also like heard, done all the all the everything. I had also heard Titus O'Neill was thinking about running for the mayor of Houston. Titus O'Neill lives in Tampa, so that would be a good trick. Uh, you know, it, it was something I had heard, and maybe it was just. Uh, Corey Graves just giving Booker a hard time. That was probably it. So, but other than that, let's uh, let's get into this week's wrestling news. Um, it, it took a while. It, it, it wasn't right after WrestleMania like we thought, but we had a f- couple of the future endeavors pop up. Yep, and I mean the only one that's really surprising is Emma. Uh, um, yeah, Summer Rae hasn't been around for what a year at least, maybe. She two. hasn't been on TV in over a year. Yeah, uh, and then and then Darren Young is another one who, you know, they they tried with him. They they tried. They the, did the primetime players. I don't they know why they the broke them with up. Backlund. Yeah, the deal with Backlund. We were talking about this the other day. Um, you know, I uh, so I'm not surprised at those two, but Emma. Uh, is is kind of surprising. Well, especially coming off of the fact that she was the debut opponent for Asuka right. on uh, TLC and then wrestled her again the next night on Monday Night Raw. But, right. Uh, Sports Illustrating is reporting... Sports uh, Illustrating. That, is, that, it, yeah, is that a new one? That's a uh, new magazine? Sports Illustrating? I said Illustrated. No, you did not, sir. I didn't? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Uh, once again, long day. So Sports Illustrated has been reporting that Emma had enemies on the writing staff that yeah, contributed that. to her release. I saw that. Um, so, I mean, the, it, it also states in the article that the door remains open for her return to the company. Uh, but some people think that it's not going to happen for a while if she yeah. comes back. But uh, Well, I think the know. bigger story coming out of this is the Leo Rush thing. And okay. That he oh. posted up on Twitter, you know, I guess this is what happens when you are, in fact, not ready for Asuka. And he's been just... Uh, destroyed by yeah he was catching a lot of crap by everybody yeah and uh, NXT roster was you know talking crap about him the main roster was talking crap about him Ex employees were talking crap about him well at least he didn't pose with the bullet club though so yes you yes. know um so, you know, interesting. I, I, I was surprised it took this long, uh, but I'm also surprised that it was only three. Yeah, well, okay, so 
consider that they've got a lot more room than they did a year a couple of years ago. Yeah, you know? I. I- I do, but I mean, it always seems like when you just take a look, I mean, and I'm not even counting 205 Live into the equation, um, but just between NXT, Raw, and SmackDown, there are still a ton of people that they are not using on television. I know they're being used on house shows yep. uh, and stuff, but it just, it's surprising me that, that with the way they're booking and getting everything leading up to some of these pay-per-views, especially Survivor Series, that we're just not, uh, they don't have a place right now, and they haven't had a place for a while. Well, you look at people like, uh, like, say, Mike Kanellis, for example. Uh, Mike Kanellis is not a solo act. He requires Maria to be there because of the, the gimmick, and Maria's pregnant. And well, rumor is, is is that supposedly both Maria and um, Maurice will not be coming back once their pregnancies um, go full term. Well, I haven't heard about that, but um, I mean, they then they're going to have to think of something new to do with with Mike and maybe having him just go back to being Mike Bennett and doing something there is uh, not a bad idea, but. You know, he's still on house shows, and you've also had uh, Eric Rowan and Luke Harper facing each other, like in tag matches, six-man tags on opposite sides on house shows, but now they're coming in and doing something completely different. So maybe they'll do something with Mike uh, Kanellis. Who knows? But I, I assume he was he's one of the people that you're talking about of them having not doing anything with. Yeah. So, well, best of luck to them. I I think Emma's going to do fine. I don't think she's going to have a problem going anywhere. Uh, Summer Rae's probably done in wrestling. Yeah. And, and, And who knows with Darren Young. So Yeah, Darren Young will probably go the Impact Ring of Honor route. He might go to New Japan. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I hope he doesn't go to Impact because we saw what happened the last time they had a, a non-heterosexual wrestler there that was openly non-heterosexual. They just made him as horribly awkward as possible. I don't remember who Orlando that was. Orlando Jordan. Oh, okay. It was, it was bad. It was bad? It was bad. Okay. Well, uh, on another note, Braun Strowman uh, reappeared on Monday Night He's Raw alive. after being thrown into a uh, trash truck. Yeah, um, so I don't know, like if he's just decided that he's just going to sleep in garbage trucks or something because he showed up in a different different truck. I uh, yeah, com- completely different. He he got he got murdered in a uh, white truck and was resurrected in a red in a truck. It was red, bright was red. red. Yeah, bright red. So, uh, but he he was actually asked about it on being thrown into the garbage truck, and his response was that uh, it was terrifying. At any given moment, I thought I was going to be crushed to death. Being stuffed in the back of a garbage truck with tons of trash and all that stuff at the end of the day was not ideally what I was looking to do, but I enjoy going out there to do that for the fans. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it is pretty funny, though, to just see, you know, hear a guy like Braun Strowman, just as big as he is, as strong as he is, and then he just goes, yeah, that, that pretty much scared the crap out of me, which, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's it's a trash compactor. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it'll crush it'll crush a car if you if you try to put it in there. Yes. So um, I, uh, I I as far as what happened on Raw, I didn't care for the uh, uh, the visuals of him, uh, you know, standing in front of the limo and doing his roar and all of yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. But and what happened after that was incredible. Yes. His de- his just utter destruction of poor Curtis Axel. Uh-huh. Yeah, who, you know, I guess Which, an eye for an eye, they murdered Braun, so Braun murdered him. I guess. I mean, he wasn't even part of it. Curtis was an innocent bystander. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's true. Um, but, you know, here, here's a question I have, and, and I really don't want to get into a, a whole review of Monday Night Raw, yeah. but what was your reaction to this week's show? Uh, very middling. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I'm I'm really just not into what they're doing right now. Um, it also just seems like unless they decide to throw us a big swerve, I'm really not a fan of the majority of these matches having already been determined with the exception of the traditional Survivor Series matches. Um, no, I'm cool with it in, in that aspect because well, the, the matches aren't most of the matches aren't any particular person against well, any particular person with the exception of Lesnar and Mahal. No, well, no because they've already, they've already they've already said the Miz I no, they have US. said I C versus US. And, and they're showing but they, they're showing on TV the current champion. Sure. And but unless the, the Usos are taking on Benjamin and Gable on on SmackDown next week week and so things things can change I, I mean I don't know uh, how many other titles are on the line at any you know well there's no but, there's no I, well as of right now there's none I mean, I mean before the, the shows before the Survivor only, Series the only one that I could think of is and I know you're not a fan of probably what I'm about to say but I have a feeling that we're gonna see uh, Natty lose the title to Charlotte in the next week or two just to have her as the women's champ going up against Alexa Bliss. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. It's I just, think Charlotte it, in the five on five match is valuable. Well, we'll we'll find out, but I just I think that might be the only title change we'll see. And that's why I was saying it kind of, you know, gets me that they're saying title against title because unless something big happens, you know, the majority of these people, I mean, they've already started a trip uh sorry, a Twitter war. I know. Uh between the Miz and um, yeah. Baron Corbin, right? So it, it's it's one of those where it's like, well, great, I'm going to go three weeks, and and I know that we pretty much won't see any title change. No, but so. see, I'm good with that. I like the idea of having the card built and ready to go and them having three weeks to build interest in existing matches that's how they used to do it you know i remember back in the in the late 90s the night then let's for uh, for example the night after in your house revenge of the taker on raw with no uh with no uh, pomp and circumstance, no number one contender match, nothing like that. They just announced that Steve Austin was the next contender for the World Wrestling Federation Championship. Yeah. And so they they had weeks to build to that uh, that match. Mm-hmm. And so, and the the uh, the setup for the the gauntlet match between Ahmed Johnson and the Nation had been going on pretty much since WrestleMania. Yeah, and um, they had the uh, the the uh, no holds barred fight between Ken Shamrock and Vader. Shamrock's first WWF match and that had some build up to it and so they the, the card was was set weeks before the event in order for them to build to the event with the existing card Vice having to build the card and the interest for the event at the same time no and, and I and I understand that I just think for me I think the biggest thing is is that you always want to feel like there's a possibility Possibility, you could see a title change when you're watching Raw or SmackDown, right. even though it doesn't happen all the time. And just because of the fact they're doing champion versus champion, like you already know, Brock Lesnar's locked in. That that title's not going anywhere because right. he won't even show up until that pay per view. So that's my only complaint. I understand building the card in advance. You have to do that. But I just think the problem is with this title for title is that. 
I'm going to be watching Raw and SmackDown now for the next couple of weeks, and unless they decide to throw a curveball in there, um, no titles are going to change hands. Well, right, until- but I mean... If you are, if you're watching the show only for title changes, which I know you're not, but no, if I'm you're not. watching the show only for a title change, then that's the wrong reason to be watching no, it. Number one. Agree, number two, nice, if the titles, a- if there is a title match, then just by virtue of that, there being a title match, regardless of how one-sided it could be or whatever, you have the chance of the title changing hands. Do I think yes. Shelton Benjamin and Chad Gable are going to win the titles next week? No, I don't. Nope. But they could. They could. And um, so that could throw a monkey wrench in as far as Rollins and Ambrose are concerned because they've got two weeks now to prepare for a different team. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, think about it like this. In 94... 93-94. Brett and Owen Hart were going to be facing the Quebecers for the tag titles. Mm-hmm. So, at the Royal Rumble. So, uh, the Royal Rumble is on the 23rd or 22nd of January, or something like that. Yeah. On January 10th, on a live Raw, the 1-2-3 Kid and Marty Jannetty win the tag titles. The tag title yes. match was already set for Royal Rumble. But the one, two, three kid, Marty Jannetty won the tag titles. So then, um, the uh, the match between the Quebecers and the Hearts becomes a non-title match. And then the next week at a Madison Square Garden house show, the Quebecers won the tag titles back. So just because the uh, the card is locked in doesn't mean things can't change. All it means is that the card will change because it's the titles that are locked into the matches, yeah. not the performers. No, I get it. So uh, two other things on Monday Night Raw, and then we'll we'll move over to the... Well, we'll continue with Raw on the 25th anniversary. But um, what did you think about Stephanie returning? And, by the way, it looks like my prediction from last week... Uh, comes true a little bit when I said that it looks like we were, we could possibly see uh, Kurt Angle versus Shane McMahon at Survivor Series, and we are going to see it, just they're going to be uh, in the uh, Survivor Series match. Well, so. I mean, I uh, I don't want to I don't want to sound all super jerky when I say this, but I think that Shane and Kurt being the captains of their teams, once they announced that the match that they were going to do a five on five match was kind of a given. Yeah. Um, so I, I still think that we were, we're going to see Shane versus Kurt at WrestleMania. I would. But now the question is though, with the way that Stephanie came in, and, and Stephanie was acting, it looks like they could also be trying to set up Kurt Angle Triple H at WrestleMania. That's been a that's been a rumored uh, a rumored match. Well, that was for, that um, was the minute, original but... rumored match for his return period. Yes. when he came back. Right. So, but um, rumored by who though is the is the question. That is true. Right. Uh, and, and by the way, Triple H, you gotta love the guy. He he's been doing some filling in lately. Uh, but what was it? Last week he filled in for Kevin Owens yeah, at we, house shows in Argentina, and he was twerking. And, and you know what? You got to give him credit. Uh, the money that he made uh, for the competing portion, he actually gave that to Kevin Owens. Oh, cool! Uh, and then, well, I guess he I had some kind of a family emergency or something. He, like, he did. He had a family emergency. They've, and then, they've I don't kept know. the cause quiet. Only his wife saying, "Hey, thanks to WWE yes. for letting him come home." And then so. I don't know if you also saw this, but Triple H made an honorary Shield appearance. Yeah, in Glasgow. Yeah, I did see that. So uh, definitely interesting. But we'll we'll continue on with Raw. Uh, Raw has announced 25th anniversary taping is going to be held at the Barclays Center. I believe it's January 25th. It is January 22nd. Second, and it's the Barclays Center and the Manhattan Center. 
they're oh see now i didn't know that yes they announced that i want to say on smackdown last night oh that, okay. that they are me, going to be doing the they are doing the barclays center and the manhattan center i don't know how they're going to do it but um that that's that's an interesting thing maybe they'll do like a one hour throwback raw and then go over to the barclays center for the two hours or who knows well, and it's been confirmed that we are going to see The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and Kevin Nash. Okay, all so on. it has been confirmed that we will see Shawn Michaels and Kevin Nash. It has been rumored on air that The Undertaker is going to be there. Now, off air, yeah, it's been confirmed that The Undertaker's going yeah, to be there. Yeah, okay. That's, that's probably the best way to say it. Um... I'm very excited about this. Uh, it, 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 it makes me feel old. Well, yeah. Knowing that Raw is turning 25 years old. Um, but I do love the fact... Raw is older than my sister. That, oh, God. Why do you have to say that? Yeah. Lindsay, um, Lindsay was born in April of 93. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the one thing I do have to say, and, and we mentioned it in our very, very first episode, I loved watching the smaller venue for Raw. Yeah, and, it was great. And that, Man and that Manhattan Center is a very intimate building. Um, I, I just, I love the fact, and, and maybe it's because of the fact that the WWE has, has basically said, the likelihood of us ever going back for the big, you know, WrestleMania 30, it wasn't held at MSG like a lot of people wanted it to. Yeah, but it, it honestly, it can't be anymore. If they can fill up a 100,000 no, seat I, arena, I they can, I, they it would be it would be obscene. For them, I, because for their shareholders, like no, no, like that's I, the kind of thing that gets people kicked out of that gets people fired. <laughs> no, no, and 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 I agree, uh, and I'm not saying that. Right. What I'm saying is, it is just, it is very nice to know, you know, from what you just said, though, that they are going to go back to where it all began, even if it's just for, you know, I don't care if it's for one match. You know, at at the Manhattan Center, it is pretty cool that they're going back to where it all started. Right. And I mean, I would be OK if the if they did it kind of like the, the raw 10th anniversary, as opposed to doing it like a sit down banquet, though, like they did in, a, in an award show like the Slammys yes. light. So I wouldn't mind if the, uh, the stuff at the Manhattan Center was all interviews. And um, they just saved the matches for the Barclays Center. Uh, I, I can see where you're going with on that. I mean, I personally would still like to see at least a match or two. And if maybe they decided to do a vintage match where they had some of the older wrestlers come back and do like a vintage Raw segment where they, they did some matches there, that would be great too. Um, Depends but on it, who it is. Huh? Depends on who it is. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It totally depends on who it is. So, I mean, like I said, it's just it's nice to see them going back there. Um, just the history. So I'm I'm very excited for it. It's definitely one of those raws that I don't want to miss. Yeah, no, I'll definitely be watching it now. Um, I'm not positive. What date is the Royal Rumble this year? Is this, uh, the, this isn't the go home show for. The, I thought uh, it. Rumble, I thought it? it was. Hold Hang on. on. I'm pulling what? it up myself. I am right now. Royal Rumble. I for some reason I decided to type it into a text message to you. Go figure. That's that's okay. I'm super uh, the Royal Rumble is on January twenty. Hold on. It would that either was... be the twenty first or the twenty eighth. 28th. So it's, it, the 28th. It's, it's the go home show for the Royal Rumble. See, now, to me, that is a mistake because um, they they uh, are going to be taking away from the the Royal Rumble with this show. Now, I mean, I get it. They they probably couldn't book it the week earlier to have it on the uh, what would be the 15th. 
So, um, and then have another week. Yeah, I mean, I get it. But and they've also got a three-hour show, and maybe that's why they're doing it at both venues, is so they can do one hour of just the Raw anniversary and then focus on the Royal Rumble. Uh, true. Um, Hold on. One that's just pure speculation on my part, though. Yeah. Uh, well, I also think it just came down to a matter of scheduling. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, no, that's exactly simple. what I was just saying. That's exactly yeah. what I was just saying. Getting getting into New York, uh, you know, for the right time. Because what date again was the very first Monday Night Raw? January 11th. January 11th. Okay, that's right. Uh, so excited about that. Uh, really quick, I, I do want to go over something from SmackDown really quick. Okay. God, I love the New Day. Oh, yes. I, that, I've got I to make not, sure that I show this episode to Katie because oh, the New Day is her favorites. I have not laughed that hard in a long time watching WWE programming. I mean, he I mean, shaved his beard off for that for that costume. Yeah, for he shaved off his goatee. Yeah, I mean, for them to come out as Akeem, Brother Love, and Jimmy Hart was priceless. No, but I'll tell you what. Again, Corey Graves, man, when 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 uh, Tom Phillips said, or it might have been Byron Saxon said. He he is he is the spitting image of of Akeem or something like that. And Corey <laughs> Graves says, "Well, I can think of one big difference." <laughs> oh, it was great. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, it was absolutely great. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I thought that was great. And then can we also just agree on the fact that that. Uh, match between Rhino and uh, Heath Slater versus Gallows Brothers, and Anderson yeah. was just god awful. Um, I mean, it was what it was. It, it, it's matches like that. Uh, seriously, it, it is matches like that that have always made me embarrassed to be a wrestling fan. <laughs> I've never been embarrassed to be a wrestling fan because there are people that dress up like Klingons and go to conventions. I No, no, no. I there are people that dress fan, up like it, Klingons and go to work. That is true. But <laughs> it's matches like that where when I try to tell people why I love wrestling and then they decide to tune in and they see an, a, a match like that and they literally are just like, seriously? That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but I mean, just like just like a lot of other things, sometimes you've got to you've got to sit through the shit to get to the the treasure. No, it's it's I get it. It's just that was just a horrible match, though. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, again, it, it was what it was. Just be glad that we've gotten beyond having you know five years ago that would have been the women oh in some sort of a like lingerie pillow fight a pudding match something pumpkin pie match yeah something and so I mean I, I suppose it's it's a good thing that we're now to the point where the men can be denigrated instead of the women I guess. <laughs> I, I I guess. I don't. Oh, I don't. No. I don't even know. I I just. Yeah. It was bad. It was bad. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um. So did I? I told you that I was listening to it. Did you get a chance to finish? Uh, Jr.'s book, Slobberknocker, My Life in Wrestling. Yeah, I sure did. I finished it yesterday. What did you think about it? Um. Okay, so I'm going to be be very, very honest. Um, I loved it. I loved the content of it. I think it would be really difficult to read because the narrative format when you're when you're when you're listening to it and it's being told in like five minute segments, that's fine. But that means that the chapters of this book are running like five pages long. Well, when I told you that I was going to start because you, you said you were originally going to go buy the book. Uh, yeah. 
And I said, you know, I don't have the time to read it. I'm on the road all the time, so I'm going to get the book on tape. And I'll be honest with you. I've listened to books on tape before, Mm -hmm. and I'm not a big fan of listening to books on tape. It just – it – I don't know. Sometimes the, 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 the reading just does not come off well. Yeah. For me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a book about, and I know he talked about it. He said it, it is one of the few times in his life that he was truly worried about uh-huh. his performance because he's never done anything like this before. Right. And it did. And, and, and while I really enjoyed it, it did come off very uh, scripted. Oh, of you course. You definitely did. tell he was reading. You, you definitely can. But the one thing I told you is that how can I not? This is the guy that for me is the voice of wrestling. Right. I mean, he he is to, to, to wrestling fans. He is my Vin Scully, right. my Bob Miller and my chick Hearn. Right. You know, I mean, those are the voices I listened to and grew up with for baseball, hockey uh, and basketball. And he is that voice for me in wrestling. So right. to hear him read his book was just to me very fitting. And it was, I will be- t- it was definitely the best way to, to experience the his book. And, and I will tell you people, if, if you guys decide to get JR's book, I mean, I'm definitely going to buy the book uh, or I'll tell my wife to get it for me for Christmas or something, just because I do want to go through it. And there are, from what I heard, a lot of pictures in, in the actual book itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you get a chance, listen to the book. Oh, yes. Because there are parts in the book, and I don't really want to give too much away, but there are parts in the book where you can truly tell he was having a hard time reading them because right. he was getting so emotional. There was um, the 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 parts that were the easiest to listen to that felt the le- the le- the least scripted were the parts where you could tell he was really feeling it because he he would uh, anytime he was talking about his wife. Oh yeah. Um, and especially you know with the things that you didn't know about about like when they were split up. After yep. they first started, after they first moved in together, and um, anytime he would do voices, uh, when he would do the voices of the uh, of the person that he was telling the story of, it really felt a lot, a, a lot better. It was a lot closer to listening to his show than listening to somebody reading a story. Definitely. Um... I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. There were, I, I mean, there were parts in that book where I laughed. There oh, were yes. parts of that book where I literally was crying listening to him talk about things. Um, it, it was a very, very good book. I, I, I've heard that there is talk because he he ends the book in 1999. Right. Um, and, and for those of you. You know, if if without giving too much away, he starts the book and ends the book. WrestleMania 15. With WrestleMania 15. Now, during the bookends, he goes back to how he got into the business and then works his way back to WrestleMania 15. Very similar to uh, Mick Foley's book. Mm hmm. Definitely. The so fir- his first book. And so there is talk that he is going to do another book that will continue from 1999 at WrestleMania 15 to present day. Yeah. And I will tell you this, you know, if he does, I, I and I hope I hope he does. I will be one of the first people to buy that book and buy the audio. Yep. Um, I cannot say any bad things about the book. And truthfully, JR really doesn't say anything bad about anybody in except the book except Bob for Sweetan. Bob Sweetan. Yep. Um, oh, he, he truly despises that man. It and I'll be honest. Very apparent. Well, and, and I'll be honest. I do too. Oh yeah. I never I never knew of Bob Sweetan, 
But from just hearing how JR talked about him to the stuff that I was able to read, uh, I I mean that mm, that that is just a bad guy. Yeah, the uh, the phrase "scum of the earth" is very appropriate. That that does, no, I don't even think that that covers. I mean, I think that's being nice, truthfully. Well, sure, but I mean, um, so. But yeah, I mean, great book. If you guys get a chance, highly check it out. It. I, I highly recommend it too. Uh, hope he does another one. So, but that's it for the uh, wrestling news this week. Um, uh, went, so went quick. It, it, it did. I mean, it was a pretty slow week when it came to, to news. I mean, I was even looking in, in other, nothing really big coming out of Ring of Honor, nothing really big coming out of Impact. I mean. Uh, no, I mean, the only the only big thing coming out of Impact is we're coming up to uh, Bound for Glory. Yes. And um, you got the global championship of uh, Eli Drake against Johnny Impact. And uh, the OVE is defending the Impact Tag Team Championship against um, uh, LAX, Santana, and Ortiz in a 51-50 street fight. Mm -hmm. And so basically it's OVE versus all of LAX. And then um, they were the, the the Impact Women's Championship match was supposed to be uh, Sienna versus... Uh, Gail Kim versus Taryn Terrell versus can't remember who the fourth person w- was for some reason and I guess Taryn Terrell left is, okay. is gone so I don't know what they're doing with that women's match uh, but it's still uh, Sienna and Gail Kim are still part of it I know that and then um, beyond beyond that I don't know what the uh, what the rest of the card is looking like yeah, so. I, I haven't I haven't taken a look yet. Um, I've just I'll, been too I'll, busy. Yeah, well, same here. So, uh, but we'll we'll take a look at that leading up to Bound for Glory. Uh, we might. We'll, def- well, I mean, leading up to it might be coming up this weekend. I'm not certain. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not either. So we'll 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 take a look, and and if it does happen this weekend, yeah, we'll, it's we'll on try to- uh, Sunday. It is on Sunday. It is okay. On Sunday. So, so we uh, we definitely are going to need to do a uh, a follow up on that next week. Sounds and good. We are we are ill prepared, and I apologize to our Impact Wrestling fans out out there, all three of them. And um, we'll, uh, we'll. So you're telling me we have the entire Impact Television viewing audience listening? Then, yeah, probably. With with the three, so. yeah. If you can even find out. Um, the okay. Channel. Okay. So I've got the card here. Okay. So go yeah. Ahead. So it's like I said, Eli Drake versus Johnny Impact. Um, uh, they're doing a uh, they're doing a six way match for the X Division Championship. Trevor Lee, the champion, versus Desmond Xavier, uh, Garza Jr., Matt Seidel, who is uh, Evan Bourne, uh, Petey Williams, and Sanjay Dutt. And then the tag title match, OVE versus LAX in a 51-50 street fight. Sienna versus Allie. That's who I was thinking was the uh, the other person in the match was Allie. Okay. But it's the Sienna versus Allie versus Gail Kim in a three-way match. Um, they're doing Moose and Stefan Bonner versus Lashley and King Mo in a Six Sides of Steel match. Um, uh, Grado versus Abyss. In a Monsters Ball match. I forgot about that one. Rosemary versus Taya Valkyrie. And then Team Impact uh, being Eddie Edwards, uh, Ethan Carter III, and James Storm versus Team AAA. This is Elio de Fantasma, uh, Pagano, and Tejano Jr. And so that's that's the card there. And um, that's on Sunday. They're doing that in Canada. It's it's being filmed. It's being done in Ottawa, and then they're doing like a week of TV tapings out there as well. So um, next week's a busy week for uh, for Impact, starting with Sunday. So we'll make sure you know. Hope, but maybe we can uh, we can try to do a do our first uh, live reactions or our first uh, post pay per view reactions for that one. Maybe you know before sometime before we do next week's show that would be nice but uh 
you know, we'll see. All right. Well, uh, folks, go ahead. Check out our site at ProWrestlingAlmanac.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PW Almanac and on Facebook. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and on iTunes, and we can be heard on TuneIn Radio and Google Play. Uh, so now it's going to be time for Stump the Almanac. All right. So we're going to we're gonna try to go through this one quickly. Um, I know that I've had some really tough trivia for Tristan lately. Uh kind of brutal so we're gonna go with uh 10 trivia questions some may be considered easy some may be considered hard once again he does not even know what we're gonna be talking about uh but we're gonna do some trivia on the intercontinental title oh okay okay so we'll start off with question number one uh there are a few of them that are multiple choice and i'll give you those when it comes time i will ask you for them just like always yeah uh, if I so, need them, I'll ask. Uh, who is the longest reigning WWE Intercontinental Champion? Honky Tonk Man. That is correct. Now, bonus points. Can you give me the dates? Oh, shoot. Um, I know he won it in July of 87. Um, I can't remember the exact date. And then he lost it August 29th, 1988. Okay, you were close. You, you were dead on on the date that he lost it. Yeah, he won it June eighty seven. It was June second, yeah. correct? So, okay, there you go. Uh, number two, who walked into WrestleMania three as the Intercontinental Champion? Randy Savage. Wow, correct. you're you're gonna you're you're making me look 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 bad. <laughs> uh, number three. Now this is a multiple choice, and I'll have to give you these. Wow. Which of these legendary superstars has never held the WWE Intercontinental Championship? Piper. Snuka, Santana, or Morocco? Snuka. Snuka, correct. Um, WWE Hall of Famer Tito Santana is a two time WWE IC champion. Which two superstars did he defeat to take those titles? John Morocco and Greg Valentine. Correct. Um, number five, Mr. Perfect, arguably one of the greatest IC champions ever. Uh, who well, upset- that's inarguably. Arguably the greatest. Inarguably one of the greatest. Uh, who who upset Perfect by taking his IC title in a surprise victory? Carry Von Eric. Summer- okay, SummerSlam 90, Carry Von Eric. Correct. WrestleMania 2000 featured a triple threat uh, match for both the IC Championship and European Championship in a two fall match. Which participant was Chris the Benoit. only? Well, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're you're no. Which which of these participants was the only one to walk out without a title? Kurt Angle. Correct. Uh, next one. We have which of these teams' members are not both former IC champions? The Rockers, TNA, Heart Foundation, or the New Age Outlaws? Heart Foundation. Correct. Uh, Razor Ramon has held the WWE IC title on several occasions as well. Which uh, of these men is the only one who did not defeat Razor for the title? Shawn Michaels, Gold Dust. Shawn Michaels. Jeff Jarrett. It's Shawn Michaels. Shawn, I had, Michaels, Shawn Michaels did not beat Razor. Oh, did not beat Razor Ramon for the Intercontinental Championship. Correct. Correct. I don't know who your fourth person was, but it was Shawn. it was it was going to be Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number nine. RVD won his first IC title at WrestleMania 18. Who did he take it from? William Regal. Correct. And the very last one. Now, this one might be a toughie. Okay. The WWE IC title spawned from a very short-lived title known as the WWWF North American Championship. Out of these four, who was the only wrestler to hold this title? Ken Patera, Ted DiBiase, Pedro Morales, and Pat Thompson. I don't know who Pat Thompson is, but it's Ted DiBiase. It is Ted DiBiase, correct. Well, you went 10 for 10. 
That's, so, I, I mean, no, no disrespect. Good for you for finding 10 questions like that. Some of them were a little more difficult than others, but they were pretty easy questions. I, I, Hey, you know, some weeks they will be, some weeks they won't. So when you start, um, when you start getting into like specific shows and who phase two, very few people are going to be able to figure those out. So those are good questions for like, if you want to stump me. Um, those are the types of questions that you should be asking. If it's if you're looking for hard questions that I may or may not be able to answer, you may want to may want to go somewhere in the middle of where you were today. And oh, where definitely. You were last week, because last definitely. week last week was rough, man. <laughs> last week was tough. So, but uh, once again, folks, if you have any questions uh, and you want to try to stump the almanac, please send them into the email address we have set up, which is stump the almanac at gmail.com uh, so now guys we're gonna take a break we're gonna sit back look into wrestling history as we're visited by the ghost of wrestling past Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold I am who what are you? I'm the ghost. Wrestling's hot. So uh, for this week's Ghost of Wrestling Past, uh, it was going to be Chad's turn. He he had actually picked a show before he decided to take his leave of absence from the podcast. So we decided that we would at least continue with his choice. And he chose uh, Fall Brawl 1997 War Games, which took place on September 14th uh, at the Lawrence Joel Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That became the uh, that was pretty much the standard venue for fall brawl yes it was um so pretty pretty simple card uh eight matches in total uh opening match of the evening was eddie guerrero versus chris jericho for the wcw cruiserweight championship uh a match that clocked in at 17 minutes and 19 seconds. Uh, me was personally, it really that long? It was that long. Wow, that was a fast-paced match. It was. That and match, I w- it, it To me, that was the match of the night. Oh, absolutely. Um, the only the only drawback of that match for me, and it's, it's it has nothing to do with the match. Um, I'd never seen this show before, so there was a few little... Uh, a few things that I didn't know were coming. Um, this was not one of them. I knew that Eddie was going to win the title because I knew, because I'd seen Halloween Havoc. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that the uh, the Cruiserweight title match was Eddie versus Ray in a title versus mask. So, yeah. um, like, like, I had no idea Alex Wright was ever TV champion. Okay. Let alone, you know, going into the show as TV champion. So this mm-hmm. was this was a fun experience for me, uh, watching this one and seeing seeing things that I which I hadn't I didn't remember or didn't know. That was actually the third match of the night. Right. Uh, Alex Wright defeated Ultimo uh, Ultimo Dragon uh, for the TV title. Uh, it, and that was could act- have arguably been the match of the night. That it, was a it great really, match. And it was actually longer than the Jericho Guerrero match. It clocked in at 18 minutes and 43 seconds. Which uh, is quite unusual for a television title match. Um, uh-huh. And they mentioned that on the show. That because it was on pay-per-view, Mike Tanay, uh, about, about the 10-minute mark said now the standard 10 minute time limit doesn't apply because this is on pay-per-view yes so um second match of the evening was the steiner brothers with ted dibiase uh defeating harlem heat um match is exactly what you would expect it to be it really was except for the fact that i really forgot how ridiculously looking uh scott steiner was with his man bun and the dark goatee with the long dark hair yeah um the uh yeah the the intermediary uh scott steiner between steiner brothers and big papa pump uh was he was definitely going through a transitional phase for his his look mm-hmm. and uh 
but as far as the match goes, man, this was just four dudes just knocking the crap out of each other for, for about for about ten minutes. Uh huh. <laughs> I mean, it, it it was a good match. I mean, Harlem Heat was a good tag team. Oh um, yes, you know. I mean, Booker T and Stevie Ray. Uh, you know, they had. I forgot how many title runs did they have? Something like ten, eleven, something like that. Something but yeah, stupid. I mean, they they were they were a solid tag team, and so were the Steiner brothers. Um, well, it's very rare that you get to see two actual brother tag teams face off, and that is true. I mean, it, it is very rare. Um, you you don't really see that. You see singles res- single wrestlers normally thrown together, or brother teams that aren't actually brothers. Brothers, Ed, Edge and Christian, the Beverly Brothers, what happened? Yes, e- exactly. So, uh, fourth match of the night, Jeff Jarrett defeated Dean Malenko uh, in a singles match. That was actually probably my second favorite match of the evening. It was a good match. Um, Dean, Malenko, mean, Dean, Dean Malenko in 1997 was actually number one on the PWI uh, 500. I was just going to say, I've always enjoyed watching Malenko uh, in the ring. I mean, he had, he, I mean, he was a true ring general. I mean, he could control a match, yeah. dictate the pace. Well, and Jared's uh, no slouch either. No, no, he he's not. And, and, and I have nothing bad to say about Jared in this match. I mean, I just think hands down out of the two, Malenko is, of course, I think the better wrestler, but Malenko is one of those guys that, I mean, there's a reason why with him still being retired that the WWE is held on to someone like him. Oh, yes. I mean, that man is very valuable uh, for everything from ring psychology to, you know, wrestling moves, submission moves. Uh, he he is how one of show, those. How to show immense amounts of personality in a match. And how to be an ice man <laughs> and show none. Oh yeah, that's that's right. That's Dean Malenko. That's Dean Malenko. I, um, I was thinking of Disco Inferno. <laughs> their well, name, you know, their names rhyme. It's not well, my fault. You know, if we ever want to see someone do the Saturday Night Fever entrance, we know who to go to. But uh, yeah. I mean, he he is one of those wrestlers that will go down as a complete package wrestler oh that's totally false <laughs> because he had zero personality i don't care about the personality then he, then I, he can't go down as a complete package though uh, I, his character worked though for me it did i don't okay. think he had okay. to have the personality i mean uh, okay i'll get i'll give you that that he he, he was what he was Exactly. I mean, I mean, that's why his in WCW, I mean, his when they introduced him, it was the Iceman Dean Malenko. Now. So now here's the thing that was that I found to be uh, odd about this match. Okay, this was uh, mid-September 1997. Correct. Um, The winner of this match got a title shot for the U.S. title at Halloween Havoc. Mm Mm-hmm. It wasn't much after this match. In fact, I think it was before Halloween Havoc. And if it wasn't before, it was just after that Jeff Jarrett came back to the WWF. And... I'm uh, so so uh, knowing this. That was another uh, another like foregone conclusion for me. That actually wound up being a bit a nice surprise because I was very surprised to see that Dean Malenko lost this match. Uh, he uh, Jared actually came back uh, to the WWE uh, on March second, nineteen ninety eight. No, that's. That's completely wrong. That's when Double J came back. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Double J came out. And- That's with Tennessee Lee. No, Jeff Jarrett returned because he had a match against The Undertaker at uh, In Your House DX in December of mm-hmm. uh, 97. So, um, so he definitely returned to uh, return before that. 
that's okay there it was i i had missed that section up there uh but yeah the the double j character the the country music right. singer gimmick came back on the march 2nd of 90 october 25th 1997 was when jarrett came back okay that's right so um, so and then halloween havoc was when Oh uh, God, I don't remember. Um, uh, let's see, Halloween, right Halloween Havoc was October twenty sixth. Okay, so he couldn't have come back on the twenty uh, fifth uh, then, maybe the twenty seventh. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, he well, returned immediately after Halloween Havoc. Now, did he? So so what happened there? Like Well that's that's weird. I'm reading right here that it said Jarrett returned to the WWF on October twentieth, nineteen ninety seven. Well there you go. Uh, a week yeah. before. So the a week before Halloween Havoc then. Yes. So, so so my question is did they uh did they give him the title shot in hopes that they would get him to stay and sign the contract? Because it well, says a lot. that they had Alex Wright replace Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. And, well, I mean, was... and then Goldberg attacked Steve McMichael during the match. And uh, and then Al- Alex Wright pinned, um, uh, pinned Steve McMichael. But then... Uh, but Kurt Hennig was the U.S. champion. Yeah. So yeah, this whole thing was a little uh, was a little bit bonkers. And then if you listen to uh, Jeff Jarrett's uh, return shoot, he was not very pleased with uh, being paired with Steve McMichael. He also had some pretty negative things to say about Deborah, which is hilarious considering a year later she was his manager. Uh, yeah. No, he definitely. said a woman and his he said his wife that gives new meaning to the word to the term dumb blonde in reference to Deborah. Yeah, he uh, he 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 pretty much did a, a shoot speech when he he was coming off on that. One. Right, right. So, so so but my 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 whole purpose for this this tirade was that it was just interesting that they to, had him to beat see, Malenko. Well, in in hindsight, seeing him win a match for the number one contendership for a for the champ for the U.S. championship, knowing that he was not long for WCW. Well, I figure giving him a title opportunity, trying to hold him, is a lot cheaper than three hundred thousand dollars. But well, maybe I mean, you know. So, uh, fifth match of the night, we had uh, Wrath and Mortis uh, defeating the Faces of Fear, which was Mang and the Barbarian. Um, surprisingly entertaining match. Yeah, I mean, it it, it wasn't one of those matches that was. Uh, Something to write home about, but it wasn't a horrible match. The crowd, it, it, the crowd was into it. They for were sure, and I mean, the crowd really dug the faces of fear. Yes, they did. So, so, I mean, watching watching the faces of fear versus you know Canyon and Adam Bomb was was different. But did you know, know that it, that Mortis was Canyon? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, one thing I do have to say, though, is that I would love to to hear someone do one solid podcast. And, and Jericho is the closest one uh, because he had him on. Uh, but I would love to see someone do one podcast on the stories outside the ring on Haku. Oh my goodness. They when that's the thing is that whenever anybody talks about who is the toughest guy in wrestling, hands down, that's the answer. All of the old school guys yes. say the newer guys say, Well, I've heard that it's Haku. But, but all of the old school guys, I mean, and when I say the old school guys, I'm talking like the tough guys, like the Greg Valentines and the Roddy Pipers and your Arn Andersons, 
the yeah. guys the guys that were you know when they weren't being you know uh, made a pincushion out of by Sid Vicious they were <laughs> pretty tough guys yeah and they all say uh, Haku Meng and there's I mean there's there's stories of him just absolutely massacring groups of people in oh, bars yeah. and then then so then you you consider the fact that he he really understood wrestling because he's a guy like a Ken Shamrock or a Brock Lesnar that if they don't want to do what you want them to do it's not happening and yet you never saw Meng Haku take liberties with people like you saw the Steiners or the Road Warriors do. And so it's the difference between a tough guy and a faux tough guy, if you will. That's not to say, I mean, both the Road Warriors, the Road Warriors and the Steiners could kick my ass. Oh, yeah. But Haku didn't, didn't feel the need to prove how big as Johnson was by beating up somebody that he knew he could beat up anyway. Well, I mean, I will tell you this. So I, I was just pulling up, by the way, if, if you want to hear some funny stories, uh, Jericho had Haku on his uh, Talk is Jericho podcast about a couple of months ago. And they they really went into some stories about Haku's time in Mexico uh, with Jericho. But like I, I am on Wikipedia right now and there is an into like literally when it comes to his wrestling career, they are able to sum up uh all of his time, I mean, WWF with the Islanders from 86 to 88 in, in a very short synopsis. Uh, King's Crown and the Colossal Connections, 88 to 90, another small thing. Then they get to the notoriety and incidents portion, and it is actually longer than all of his wrestling portions. I mean, mm -hmm. right here is one that, that is my favorite. Jake the Snake Roberts said during one of his shoot interviews, if I had a gun and was sitting inside a tank with one shell left and Haku is 300 yards away, he's mine, right? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is jump out of the tank and shoot myself because <laughs> I don't want to woo that son of a bitch and have him pissed off at me. Yep. I, I mean, it is just, uh, you know, uh, veteran ring announcer uh, David Penzer called Haku the scariest guy in the world, but the nicest guy in the world. He also said that Haku and the Barbarian were the two toughest guys in the history of the business. Um, so check this out. One thing that um, you might not know, some of our listeners might not know, um, if they're big uh, New Japan fans, they would. Um, I actually pulled this up just to verify it, but I, I, I was well aware of this. Um, the uh, the tag team, the Gorillas of Destiny in Correct. New Japan, uh, Tama Tonga and Tongaloa are Haku's sons. Yes, I, I actually did know that, and he made uh, a surprise return to New Japan Wrestling. I did not know that. Uh, yeah, January fourth, twenty sixteen. This was a while ago, uh, but you know he he came back uh, taking part in their. Uh, New Japan Rumble on the Wrestle Kingdom 10 pre-show. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, he, he actually talks about his sons and how they got into the business. Uh, if I remember correctly now, he's actually a car salesman in Florida. <laughs> so, I mean, that's one of those, you're going to buy the car. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, Haku. Yeah. Um, so uh, going off our tangent then, uh, sixth match of the evening, uh, the Giant defeated Scott Norton in a singles match that clocked in five minutes and 27 seconds yeah it was about four minutes and 27 seconds too long well that was pretty uh, much but the yeah. crowd was into it man they were scott norton man flash norton was a beast mm -hmm. like like i mean he's a world arm wrestling champion he he was something else like if he if he had just could have just uh like tightened his work up, he could have been something huge in the U.S. He was a, he was massively over in Japan. Mm -hmm. But 
his I don't I don't know what was keeping him from hitting the same levels in the US but it yeah, was something it, you know it's just once in a while it, he may have everything but it's just he's missing that it thing well I mean consider like Stan Hansen Vader uh all guys that were way more over in Japan than they were. Well, I think um, a lot of uh, it with Japan. Uh, Albert as well, Matt Bloom. Yeah, uh, I think a one. lot of. I think a lot of it has to do with though the style of wrestling in Japan versus the style of wrestling in the states. Um, uh, that in Japan's just got a massive hard on for gigantic white boys, I guess. That is true. Because I mean, Hogan was over Lesnar, um, and I granted not white boys, Gaijin, Bob Sapp. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, Lesnar, Hogan, uh, Scott Norton was huge. Doctor Death, Steve Williams. Yep. Uh, Terry Gordy, I want to say, was pretty big in Japan. Um, and then, uh, like I said, uh, Albert, Giant Bernard. Mm hmm. Which, you know, was why we got the Tensai gimmick in the first place. Yes. So. Uh, but yeah, so, so Norton. Uh, I know he's one of my brother's favorites. Uh, okay. He just loved that uh, turnbuckle bomb. Yeah. Definitely. But, but um, Paul White was, I don't know, he was still kind of in his I'm too good to do things phase of his career. Yeah. So, and it, I mean, and I, I, I say this knowing because this is what he has said that during this phase of his career he had a a sense of entitlement because everything was handed to him his first match he won the world championship I mean he he is admitted was admittedly an asshole oh yeah during this era and he he sometimes he would go out there and do things like just do a kip up in the middle of the ring or pull a moonsault and other times he would go out there and just do the giant stuff and that's what he did against Norton and the crowd was into it man they really were yeah the crowd the crowd loved the giant uh, I and I think that you know knowing this is one of those matches that just really really suffered from being 20 years ago yeah in that we know what happened to Norton what happened to the, to the giant mm-hmm. and so it's it's not that impressive because we've seen we've seen the giant get pinned clean by Jeff Hardy yeah <laughs> so I keep going um, back to that for some reason seventh match of the evening we had Luger and DDP uh, defeated Scott Hall and Savage with Miss Elizabeth in a no DQ match now this is how you work garbage yes this match as a match sucked it it was not good but it was one of the most entertaining matches on the card well and the fact that they used the two rings as a weapon with Scott yes. Hall stomping Luger in between them, and then Liz well, getting involved in the match, uh, going well, after and them um, throwing, and then both throwing. I mean, Savage in one ring, Hall in the other, and they were basically using DDP as a lawn dart yeah. in between the two. I mean that that was, and that's why I'm. I mean, I'm very excited to see what they're going to do and how they're going to pull off. Uh, these matches for War Games uh, NXT With Takeover Houston, rings. yeah, yeah. So I mean, it'll be that'll be interesting, but um, you know, it, it also helped having uh, the Living Legend come out during you know, that match. And that's I was going to get to that. That you know the uh, the fact that they they said that there would be no outside interference. Yep, and. I mean, until... Which is kind of funny to say for a no DQ match. Right. But until Zabisco shoved Scott Hall, they were keeping to that. Yes, they were. I mean, he never touched him. He he looked like the whole time he was trying to get Scott Hall to keep from hitting him. He actually looked scared. But then you could see... Then then Luger started to come in, and that's when, when Zabisco was just... 
playing uh, distraction. And of course, this was all, you know, long. Got you. Got to love long term storytelling that, that we just don't have anymore today, today. Yeah. Well, this was the start of you know Zabisco the crowd versus Bischoff. Well, exactly. I mean, the crowd after this match. I mean, there were portions, you know, during. Uh, you know, Monday Nitros, where the crowd started just chanting, Larry, Larry, and he would oh, stand yeah. up mid match and just do his little address his hand gesture crowd. and yeah. address the crowd. Um, I mean, this really was the start of that. And like you said, it's that long storyline that we just don't see anymore. Yeah, they're 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 afraid to tell a story that doesn't pay off at the next pay-per-view. Yes. And that was never more apparent than with the CM Punk thing when he walked out with the championship. They really could have let that go for a while, but they had to pay it off before SummerSlam. Yes. I mean, I get it. SummerSlam's their biggest show. It's not how I would have done it. It's not how a lot of people would have done it. I'm not alone in this. Yeah. But, but you know, the long-term storytelling, they, the, the, the WWE and Ring of Honor and Impact and a lot of these companies do not think we have the patience for it anymore. And maybe we don't as a whole. I know I would like to see it. I would like to see it if we went back down to a shorter... I like okay, let me let me let me say this. I could put up with a longer storyline on a show like SmackDown than I could like Raw. Because I feel like with Raw being three hours, they are having a hard time struggling to get decent content to fill all three hours. Um, so I, yeah, but but the the uh, what they what they should do is they should fill it up with with more matches. Mm-hmm. And we have if they can't come up with good storylines, obviously they don't think that they're doing this. That they don't no. think they're struggling, but a three-hour show, all that means is that they should have more ongoing stories. Yes, and as opposed to having one storyline make appearances eight times in the show, have you can have storylines revol- involving all of your championships. You can have storylines involving other wrestlers that are on the on the show. And, like, for all of his faults, and this is a pretty wide-held opinion, um, Vince Russo believed that if you were on the roster, you, we should, have a story have, you for should have something to do. Yes. And look at the Attitude Era, man. Everybody had something to do. Now, granted, that is what led to the crash TV, three-minute matches, you know, 25 segments in a two-hour show. Um, but you also had, like, intersecting storylines. Yes. A lot more than you do. Today. Well, and, and so. like you said, that was, and I've heard him on multiple podcasts, you know, his philosophy was, it's your, it's the wrestler's job to wrestle, it's our job to make sure they have something. Yeah, that's what I hate. Creative has nothing for you. You're doing your job, but we can't do ours, so you're fired. Yeah. That's always been an issue. Well, and as as evident by like we had talked about the latest the latest set of releases and with Emma having heat I, with I, I think that's a that's a different uh, a different uh, scenario than them just not having anything for her. Yeah, she she uh, really went out of her way to put creative on blast when she was coming back and they were doing the Emmalina Emma yes. thing and she really uh, really put creative on blast and she just didn't make any friends and the uh, the they're referring to it as addition by subtraction in that they feel that the women's division will be stronger with her not being there but back to 
the show here. Yeah. Um, we're talking this long-term storytelling. Mm-hmm. The the uh, the payoff with Zabisco interfering in this match was Zabisco versus Bischoff at Starcade. Yes. And so this is September. Starcade was in December. So they they say that you can't because of all of the TV that they produce now that they can't have lo- that long term storylines just don't fly. But in 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 1997, Nitro was three hours. We yep. can we can discount Thunder because we're talking about Raw being a three hour show. Uh-huh. They they did so there was no Thunder. They also had WCW main event, WCW worldwide, WCW Saturday night. Um, they produced 12 pay-per-views a year, so there were two more pay-per-views between uh, Fall Brawl and Starcade, plus three hours of TV every Monday. The the it's a it's a cop out in my opinion. They could they could absolutely do a slow burn storyline that doesn't pay off for a couple of months. And I just don't think they have the balls to. Uh, I, I I would agree. Um, I just think that they're worried about trying to do long term. I think truthfully, the biggest problem is, is that any long term that they've been thinking about even wanting to remotely get into, they've possibly been burnt on injuries or, uh, you know, people you know, leaving or or what have you. So that is their own doing because they, you look at go back several years, the uh, main event of WrestleMania five was pretty well set in stone, even in the fans eyes by the end of WrestleMania four. And they had decided going into WrestleMania 4 that they wanted to build to Savage versus Hogan. Now, for all of the complaints that Lesnar isn't around, Hogan wasn't on TV every week. Savage wasn't on TV every week. These guys were house shows. But they managed to not be injured for a year and so I think that the uh, the um, getting burned idea is also a bit of a cop out um, because guys guys get hurt it's 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 not ballet as they like to say but the the uh, the thing is, is that you have to have enough faith in your roster to be able to step up when that happens. And if you if you can't build long term plans that are flexible, then you're, in my opinion, you're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. So we've we've managed to uh, ramble about this for about ten minutes, but needless to say, I liked the long term storytelling between the NWO and WCW, and the Zabisco Bischoff thing was only one of them. I mean, look at the Sting angle that that pay, that was in almost eighteen months. Yes. So well, I mean that that's that is one of the one of the memories that and, and and you know we've we've covered it before. I was not a huge WCW guy, um, but I one of the things that I will vividly remember to this day was when the NWO was in the ring and it looked like Sting was going to make his preview, and you watched that dummy fall from. Mm-hmm the ceiling and just hit the ring. Yep. You know, I mean, I'm trying to remember what year that was. 97. What that was 97. Mm-hmm. Um so, I mean, it was it was very it, the long-term storylines, it works. Yeah. They just need to have the faith in it. So Yeah, they've just got to be able to uh 
to tell their story and not be so paranoid if one one segment of the story doesn't hit like they're expecting it to. Yeah. Because sometimes chapter three doesn't pay off until chapter nine. Exactly. You got to you got to sometimes set it up. So uh, last match of the evening was the War Games match. Uh, NWO featuring Bagwell, Nash, Six and Conan uh, defeating the Horsemen uh, comprised of Benoit, McMichael, Flair and Hennig. So the foreshadowing through the show and the uh, the storytelling through the show. I, I do as, as much as we're talking about long-term storytelling i also yes. do do really appreciate self-contained storylines mm-hmm. and this storyline uh was through the show and again the intersecting storylines gene okerlin's doing the wcw hotline pitch the nwo team walks right in front of them then a minute later they walk back and gene's like well this is going to cut into my money, but I got to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Opens the door, sees Kurt Hennig beat down. And they kept referencing it throughout the show. We yep. get to the match, the four horsemen come out without Kurt Hennig. Yep. Um, and the payoff is that Kurt Hennig turns on the horsemen and joins the NWO. Now, let me say that one... The swerve was one of the best executed I've ever seen in that so often do you see a situation where the guy's squared up against the uh, the person he's supposed to be facing and then he turns around and hits his opponent, his partner. Yeah. That's, Kurt that's Hennig, the classic. Kurt that's Hennig the classic swung way. at Kevin Nash with the handcuffs and Kevin Nash moved. And he hit McMichael. Yes. So at first you could have been like, wait a minute. Was that well, an accident? Was it not? And then he kept hitting McMichael. And then he exactly. went over to Benoit. And so the fact that he swung at Nash, it looked like, but hit McMichael, made it a little bit more... Uh, realistic made it a little bit more. You felt it a little more, in my opinion. Well, at first you were your first reaction is, "Oh crap!" You know, he hits his teammate, yeah. and then he keeps going, and you're going, "What the hell?" Yes, you know. Now, and then he pulls out the second set of handcuffs. There was a couple of elements of psychology that I really did like in the match: the going around and asking them all to submit. Yes. Why didn't they just ask Hennig? Well, I thought the same thing, you know, because he he technically was was part of Team Horseman. Exactly. You know, and and I I was watching that a couple nights ago and, you know, they got McMichael chained up on one side. You know, they got Benoit chained up on the other. And I mean, let's let's give Benoit some credit, too. I mean, that I mean, he's chained up and I mean. He's crawling the side of the cage. Oh, man. Well, okay, so Mongo's just sitting there looking mm-hmm. like looking like a, a big, fat, retired football player. Yes. And Ben Waz got his feet on the cage trying to break the hand. Like he's going to de-glove like, himself. Yeah. I mean, like, there, there's, there's a reason why even in WCW they were calling him the Wolverine. Oh yeah, I mean they're asking him, and he's spitting in people's faces, yeah. telling them, telling them, "Screw you, kiss my ass," you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was, it was amazing. But then I'm sitting there going, so, so they can't get Benoit to say it, they can't get McMichael to say it, they won't get Flair to say it. All they had to do was go to Kurt and go, "Hey, Kurt, do you, do you quit? Do you quit, yeah." And he could have just literally looked at all three of them and goes, "Yep." So. And, there, but there's a few elements going into that match or coming out of that match that were unanswered. They 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 said so it was a work all it was a, it was a ploy all along, but was it? Did the NWO put Kurt Hennig up to joining the Horsemen, or did they get to him after he joined the Horsemen? 
don't know. Yeah. So so there so I, I like when you can come out of a match going, okay, so there's multiple ways that this could have happened. Oh, definitely. It was a very so so I didn't care much for the match itself. And okay, to be to be perfectly frank, I've never really liked war games matches. Um, I've never really been a big fan of matches that cannot end before a certain condition is met. Um, as far as like the Iron Man matches, um, Iron Man matches are entertaining, you know, but you know that the match isn't going to end before a certain point. So... I mean, granted, it's you still watch a football game from whistle to whistle. You still watch all nine innings of a baseball game. I got it. But this War Games is different in that there's no... There's no sense of urgency in the match. No, there, at there wasn't. At, in any of them. At all. Until all eight, nine, ten, however many guys are in the match. So, um, I am, I am curious to see how the uh, the three team war games match is going to be. That's uh, that's got potential. Yes, um, it's gonna it's so 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 it's it's going to be different. Um, in that you could have you got one you'll have one team that has an advantage or you know is it going to be alternating between the three teams based off of the advantage are they going to do more multiple coin tosses um you know so that there's a dynamic there now i wouldn't be surprised to see them do like just a random drawing type thing yeah um, um but so so that said don't, I've never really cared for war games matches. The concept is intriguing, but in execution, it's never really done much for me. Except for the finishes. Once the the condition is met, the match becomes very interesting because now it's a multi man match in two rings in a steel cage, and that is that is interesting to me. And this one was no different because the the uh, climax of the match happened the second that Kurt Hennig came in. Yeah. And the psychology that was in play from the moment Kurt Hennig came out in the sling was great because Kurt Hennig was trying to get Flair to let him into the match, and Flair's like, no, 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 I got this. Mm -hmm. This wasn't a situation where Hennig didn't want to get in, like you see so much that makes turn make turns obvious. Yeah. This was not an obvious turn, and even knowing that it was going to happen... I was still, I don't want to say surprised, but I was still entertained by the actual swerve because it was so well done. There were no, uh, there were no loose, indicators. Loose there were no indicators. Yeah. There, there's usually, um, I mean, looking back at it in hindsight, oh, the Gehenna getting jumped, coming out in the sling, being the last man in, those were all foreshadowing but they were done so well that you really only see them when you look back mm -hmm. so wow I totally so, wanted to go 20 minutes for this segment and we're at 40 yeah uh, it, it <laughs> tends to it tends to happen so yeah, um, like all like in all you know I liked I liked the uh, I liked the show yeah um, I didn't really have any complaints about it there weren't any matches that uh, you know I sat there and was like wow great Glad, glad we got to see that one. Yeah, Fall Brawl '97 was better than the last two WWE pay per views for sure. I will definitely give you that one. So, um, so now this will be next week. Uh, it'll be your turn to yeah. choose the ghosts. So, yeah. what what are you picking for us? Um, I decided that I would do some uh, the the first ECW show that I ever saw live, uh, which was uh, Heatwave '99. 
All right. And I haven't I haven't seen that one. So yeah, this uh, it was uh, highlighted by a uh, ECW championship match between Taz and Yoshihiro Tajiri. And okay. so this that, was this that, was that'll, uh, be, that'll yeah, be good. This was nearing the end of Taz's ECW run. OK. And um, it, it was it was an entertaining show. I don't remember a whole lot of it, but I believe there was things like the Dudleys versus Balls Mahoney and Spike Dudley. Okay. And uh, there might have been a Masato Tanaka versus Mike Awesome match, but I don't recall. Well, I haven't seen it, so I can't wait. Um, yeah. I'll definitely enjoy it, hopefully. You will, you and, will enjoy it. All right. I, well, I say that with a lot of confidence. All right. Well, that's it for our Ghost of Wrestling Pass segment. And uh, now it's time for the Indie Spotlight. Tonight's featured promotion is Deny Wrestling out of Seattle, Washington. They had their first event in January of this year and will be hosting their eighth event, Defy Nine Yo Graps, on November 10th at Washington Hall at 8 p.m. It is a 21 and over event, so leave the kids at home for this one. You'll get to see Defy Champion Swerve take on Brody King, Randy Myers versus Sammy Callahan, a.k.a. Jeremiah Crane from Lucha Underground, Ethan Payne. Page, Havoc, and UFC fighter Tom Lawler. If you're curious about the numbering here, they were forced to cancel their seventh event due to conflicts with several other large summer events and unexpected production restrictions. So, because it was already scheduled, they just decided to incorporate the card into their eighth event and kept the numbering as it was. If you're interested in watching Defy Wrestling online, you can do so at defyondemand.com and also on YouTube. They're also at defywrestling.com and at defynw on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So be sure to check them out and give them your support. Also, check out these events if they're in your area. New Era Wrestling Bird Brawl on November 4th at 6 p.m. at the Buffalo Rose in Golden, Colorado. Tickets are $10. Ultra Championship Wrestling Zero presents the Invasion of the Dead at on November 4th at 7 p.m. at the Complex in Salt Lake City, Utah. Tickets are available at ucw0.com and prices will increase by $5 at the door, so make sure you pre-order these. Uh, there will be some major names in Lucha Libre at this event, and there will be a meet and greet at 4 p.m. for $15. Pre-sale prices for general admission is $25, and for VIP admission, which is seating in the first four rows, is $65. On Sunday, November 5th, Primo's Professional Wrestling Trigger will be at the Watering Bowl in Denver, Colorado at 7 p.m. and tickets are $10. Bar Wrestling Head of Household is on November 9th at 9 p.m. at the American Legion Post 241 in Baldwin Park, California. And you can pre-order your tickets for that one at brownpapertickets.com. Lucha Libre and Laughs presents Too Weird to Live, Too Rare to Die on November 11th at 8 p.m. at the Oriental Theater in Denver, Colorado. Tickets are $10 and can be pre-ordered at theorientaltheater.com. And this show is going to be headlined by LLL champion Lonnie Valdez taking on Mike Seidel and Matt Cross in a three-way dance. Also on November 11th, Rise Wrestling will be crowning their first ever grand champion at the Stronghold in Lamont Furnace, Pennsylvania at 7.30 p.m. Rocky Mountain Pro is going to be live at the Rack House Pub in Denver, Colorado on November 17th at 10 p.m. and at the Quarry in Golden, Colorado at on November 18th at 7 p.m. And New Japan and Pro Wrestling's Kevin Kelly will be at both events and you can get your tickets at therockymountainpro.com and as always if you attend any wrestling events anywhere in the world send the results to prowrestlingalmanac at gmail.com and we'll get those added to the database as soon as possible alright and remember folks check out the website prowrestlingalmanac.com 
follow us on Facebook, give us a like on Twitter and Instagram at PW Almanac. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on iTunes, and we can also be heard on TuneIn Radio as well as Google Play. Once again, if you want to try to stump the founder of ProWrestlingAlmanac.com, please send me your trivia questions to stumpthealmanac at gmail.com. Uh, now, before we go, uh, just want to remind a few people got a big event coming up uh, on Tuesday, November 7th. Uh, remember to tune into ESPN. It is going to be the ESPN 30 for 30 on Ric Flair. Um, this is going to be huge for wrestling. Uh, you know, ESPN has started covering uh, the WWE. It's on their webpage. Uh, they do a lot of articles about it. Uh, but to actually have one of the, the 30 for 30 episodes being done on Ric Flair is, is going to be amazing. I, I can't wait to see it. Uh, some of those 30 for 30s are incredible. Uh, also on the same night, uh, Ted DiBiase's uh, The Price of Fame, a story of hope, faith, and wrestling. Uh, it's a Fathom event. It is going to be playing at 7 o'clock uh, local time wherever you live. And to find out where it's going to be playing, if you'd like to see it, go to fathomevents.com uh, and just type in The Price of Fame and it'll tell you where to put in your your city or your zip code and it'll let you know what theaters it's going to be playing at but once again that'll be at 7 p.m so you'll be able to do uh the fathom event if you want and then head over home and watch the 30 for 30 so that's it folks the ref has given us the 10 count which means we're done so until next week i'm mike alongside tristan and thanks for listening and we'll see you again when the bell rings <laughs>